Good morning, everybody. Lovely to have you all join us. This morning, we're looking forward to an interesting presentation from Ralph Van Nicker. He's doubly welcome. First of all, in his own person, but then also particularly, and we like to do this when our members' children are able to come and present to us. And of course, Ralph is the, 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 the son of uh, Peter and Caroline. Now, we hope we're going to hear something about the South African patent law. And Ralph has promised that he'll dispel some common myths and, uh, and misconceptions. And uh, we're looking forward to that, especially uh, the overview of certain South African technologies that have been patented and um, uh, how they, their inventors have fared. Now, just uh, uh, something about Ralph. He is a South African patent attorney and uh, a partner at von Seidel's. He holds undergraduate degrees in electrical engineering, computer science and law, and a postgraduate degree in law from Stanford Law School. His clients range from startups and universities to global technology companies, so a wide range that he deals with. And he is, as you can expect, a frequent speaker and lecturer on intellectual property issues. And he greatly enjoys helping South African inventors to build successful ventures by protecting their technologies. And that's very, very uh, useful and important. And uh, Ralph, we're so glad that you're able to, to join us this morning and uh, talk on these very important issues. Thanks very much, everyone. Welcome and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about patent law. Now, patent law is a subset of intellectual property law. And intellectual property law, you can think of in two main categories. And those are the registered intellectual property rights and the unregistered rights. Now the registered rights are things you can only get by filing an application at an office and having those applications examined and granted by that office. And the three most important registered intellectual property rights are patents, trademarks and registered designs. Under the unregistered intellectual property rights category, the most important are copyright, which arises automatically if you are the author, of an original work, and then trade secrets, confidential information and know-how, which you can also, which is also protected by law, but doesn't require you to file an application or register anything at an intellectual property office. So if intellectual property law is already a rather arcane part of the law, then patent law is an even smaller subset of that. I think all of the patent attorneys practicing in South Africa can fit within a large bus. I think there are about 80 or 90 of us. So it's a very small niche profession in this country, but I think it is one that is good to know about. Uh, it's, I think, personally, a very interesting area of the law. And I really enjoy it because it gives me the opportunity to talk about and share some of the successes uh, that my clients have had and learn lots about different technologies that I would otherwise not have been exposed to. So let's start talking about patents and, and what the requirements are and what, what a patent is. So the Patents Act says that a patent may, subject to the provisions of this section, be granted for any new invention that involves an inventive step and can be used or applied in trade or industry or agriculture. And that definition section really encapsulates the three main requirements for patentability. The first is that your patent, your invention that you wish to patent must be new. It must not have existed before. Uh, and the, the patent sack tells us that new means it's not available to the public anywhere in the world. So the first misconception I can quickly dispel is the one that I sometimes see where someone says, well, I saw this great product overseas. Can I patent it in South Africa? And the answer is no, because it's not new anymore. It's already available to the public overseas, uh, you need to come up with something that's new everywhere in the world. Uh, but bear in mind that that novelty must just, there must just be a difference. It doesn't have to be a particular threshold of difference. 
And then the next requ main requirement is this requirement of involving an inventive step. And there what we do is we look at the difference between your invention and that which has come before, which we call the prior art, and we ask the question as to whether that would be obvious or not to a person skilled in the art. Because the Patents Act tells us that a patent will be deemed to involve an inventive step if it is not obvious to a person skilled in the art. Now, again, the obviousness test is one which you mustn't use hindsight bias in considering. Many inventions, if you look back, seem completely obvious in hindsight. Some of the examples here include things like the kink in the hairpin, which was in fact a patented invention. And it's really the kink that made the hairpin work. And that may seem like such an obvious thing to do, but it wasn't at the time. So inventions and patents are not just for, uh, you know, people like uh, Edison, who invented the light bulb. Therefore, any novel and inventive contribution that you can make on what's existed before. This third requirement in the definition section of being used or applied in trade or industry or agriculture is really one which doesn't come up all that frequently because almost every invention you can think of can be used in some way and can be practically applied. The only example I've been able to come up with is a patent, for example, something like a sports move. And yes, there have been uh, attempts at, at patents for things like that in the past. If you were, for example, the high jumper who invented the technique of high jumping called the Fosbury flop. Uh, was that new? Sure. Was it inventive? Yeah, I think so. But can it be used or applied in trade or industry or agriculture? No, it's just something you do with your body. And that would probably fail the third requirement there, what we call the industrial applicability requirement for patents. Now, what does having a patent actually give you? Well, the Patents Act says that the effect of a patent shall be to grant the patentee in the Republic, subject to the provisions of the Act for the duration of the patent, the right to exclude other persons from making, using, exercising, disposing or offering to dispose of or importing the invention, so that he or she shall have and enjoy the whole profit and advantage accruing by reason of the invention. So a patent is in fact a right to exclude others from practicing that invention for a period. And that period referred to there as the duration of the patent is 20 years. And the rights that you have, the rights to exclude include doing just about anything you can imagine with that patent in the country in which you have it. So making it, using it, exercising the invention if the invention relates to a process or a method, disposing or offering to dispose of includes selling, renting, even giving away or importing it. So really, as the patentee of a South African patent, you have the exclusive right to the use of that invention in South Africa for the period of 20 years. Now, why on earth would we want to have a system that gives exclusive rights to certain people to practice certain things? I mean, I think most of you will agree with me that monopolies are generally a bad thing. They, they drive up prices and they reduce competition. Uh, my youngest son, or my eldest son, I'm sorry, started grade one this morning. And to me, the greatest example of why monopolies are generally bad is, is if you think about school uniforms, you know, they're invariably far more expensive than, than what you can buy at the shops, far less comfortable. And, um, you know, because, because they have a monopoly and no one else can, can manufacture and make them, it's, you have to buy it from the school, uh, from the school shop. So why would we want a system that encourages monopolies or that grants monopolies? And the simple answer to that is to provide an encouragement for innovation. Patents have been around for a long time. This is an extract here from the uh, United States Constitution, 1787, referring to Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And the very first Patents Act was passed only a few years after the Constitution in the late 1700s. And the reason that patents encourage innovation is because they provide a financial incentive for companies to invest in research and development, for private companies to invest in research and development. 
An extreme example of this is in the pharmaceutical sector, where it's now reckoned that the cost of researching and developing one new federally approved pharmaceutical is in the order of $2.6 billion. And as we know, the cost of copying a pharmaceutical, once you have a generic available, is very low. So absent patents, there would be no financial incentive whatsoever for the private sector to invest any money in research and development. And new development of pharmaceuticals would grind to a halt unless some other source of funding, like for example, uh, grants from organizations or governments would step in and, and provide the, the, the research and development funding. But the purpose of the patent system is to actually provide an incentive for companies to invest the money required to create new technologies and things like pharmaceuticals, knowing that with that 20 year term, they can recoup and then hopefully make a good profit on top of the sunk costs that they have of um, creating those products. And interestingly, in, in the case of pharmaceuticals, because they take so long to reach clinical approval, in some cases, up to 12 years, but I think typical is between six and 12 years, they only have about eight years remaining on patent before the generic companies are able to copy them. And some pharmaceuticals are so valuable that the generics will literally have a ship waiting just outside South African international waters that will arrive on the day that the patent expires so that they can start selling their generic pharmaceutical equivalent of an on patent pharmaceutical. So pharmaceuticals are, are one area where patents are certainly used extensively and do provide the incentive to, uh, for companies to invest in research and development. Another reason that patents encourage innovation is because it gives the inventors an ownership stake in their inventions. And I see this quite often in the university sector. Um, I do quite a bit of work with, with some of the large research universities here in the Western Cape. And a quote I've, I heard in a presentation a while ago, which I love, is that research is turning money into knowledge and innovation is turning knowledge into money. And universities in particular are very good at turning money into knowledge. But if we want that knowledge to benefit society, if we want that knowledge to actually create companies, if we want that knowledge to create employment, then we need to find out a way to turn that knowledge into money. And that's where patents are very helpful because, for example, if a, if a researcher, in, say the Stellenbosch Engineering or Science Faculty has come up with a really interesting technology that they've published on and that they've patented through the university, they can then start a spin-out company which can then commercialize that technology. And I'll give a few examples later on of some of the Stellenbosch University spin-out companies that I think illustrate um, this transition from uh, saying, well, perhaps universities can do more than just turn money into knowledge and also facilitate the ability to turn that knowledge back into, you know, into, uh, into money through creating companies and actual products and services. Another reason we have patents is to promote disclosure. This is a graph showing the number of patent filings at the biggest patent offices in the world. And what you'll see there is that the State Intellectual Property Office of China is now by far the biggest filer of patent applications or biggest receiver of patent applications in the world. There are over a million patent applications filed annually just in China, followed by the United States Patent Office and then the Japanese Patent Office, Korean Intellectual Property Office, and the European Patent Office. And together, we have about two and a half million patent applications being filed every year around the world in the various patent offices. And each of those patent applications is a document which is required to set out how to use and practice that invention so that when that 20 year period expires, that patent effectively becomes an instruction manual as to how to put that invention into practice. And so by encouraging disclosure, we build up a treasure chest effectively of information about technologies that have been invented, which would otherwise mostly remain unpublished. If you think about private companies, 
many of them would rather than than put their confidential information into patent applications would do everything in their power to keep that information think about the coca-cola formulation as one example there, there a company decided to rather keep that formulation secret and they were able to do it but there'd be much more of that happening if it weren't for the patent system and and i would encourage you know, if, if you ever are looking up uh, interesting research or trying to understand what's been done before don't ignore the patent records uh, google patents actually has an excellent search engine you can just get through the normal google uh, if you just search google patents and then you can look through all of these published documents uh, if you if you're ever interested in finding out more about a particular field it's a really good place to look and then one of the other reasons that we have patents is to encourage diversity of innovation because by removing the easy option to copy patents actually force others the followers to innovate as well and here i'd like to give an example of a client of mine where i saw this encouragement of diversity of innovation at work very vividly norsenet is a company based in friedenberg up the west coast they started in 1970 as a manufacturer of fishing nets in 1985 they expanded into mining and they started using these fishing nets and their net, uh, knotting machines to create nets for the mining industry and in particular for these what are called grout bags now this picture shown over here is a picture of a grout bag which is a column that they use in underground mines what they actually do is it's a it's an inflatable bag that they pump full of cementitious material think of think about it as you know wet concrete effectively which then weeps out and that column sets sets hard and what you want to do is you want to provide some sort of lateral restraint around that column so that when the mine uh, roof starts to subside a bit under pressure that you don't have a sudden failing in that column it actually yields progressively and so in 2006 Norsenet developed a product they called the yield pack this is the first claim of the United States patent actually for the yield pack and you can see the drawings there at the bottom showing how the yield pack works between a no closure position and a 30 percent closure position and what the yield pack patent is all about is having a number of rings that surround the grout pack and you have a set of inner rings and a set of outer rings inner rings are the numeral two and the outer rings are the numeral three and the outer rings are bigger than the inner rings and so that as this grout pack expands under the compression of the roof coming down the before the inner rings snap the outer rings have taken up the slack and it prog provides a more progressive yield curve uh, over the over the profile of, of its closure from in this case no closure down to 30 percent closure so I'm going to read this claim just for interest because you'll start to get a feel as to how how patent claims work. A grout pack restraining system complies, comprising a plurality of elongate elements, those are the rings, shaped to extend about a grout pack, having an initial size to control circumferential expansion of the grout pack. The elongate elements including A, a first ring having a first diameter in an unyielded condition, the first diameter size to restrain the grout pack at its initial size, the second diameter being significantly greater than the first diameter. B, a second ring supported relative to the first ring. And C, wherein the second ring has, in an unyielded condition, a third diameter, which is significantly greater than the first diameter and substantially equal to or less than the second diameter, such that in response to the expansion of the grout pack, which causes yielding of the first ring, the second ring will provide restraint to the grout pack prior to the failure of the first ring, thereby providing a progressive yield of the grout pack. I'm sure you're all scratching your heads thinking, wow, how can a patent attorney write such a long sentence about such a relatively simple invention? But this is what we need to do to set out the essential features of a patented invention in such a way that it distinguishes the patent from that which has gone before the prior art, but nevertheless isn't too narrow that it's easy enough for a competitor to avoid. So we had this patent and here in South Africa, we had a competitor come along and come up with a very similar copy of the, of the product. 
So of course, what we did was we uh, sent them a letter of demand and started the proceedings of actually enforcing the patent against them. The competitor then withdrew their product from the market and we felt very chuffed because we'd now done precisely what the patent entitled us to do, which was to have the exclusive right and enjoy the whole profit accruing by reason of the invention. A few months went by and out popped this product, which the competitor had created. And what they had done was rather than use these inner and outer rings as our patent claim required, which, which I've pasted again on the right, they in fact used these black straps, which, which are yielding straps. So the straps themselves have an overlap with a friction arrangement whereby the straps can extend and can provide the same progressive yield characteristics. Moreover, this was actually a better product. It was cheaper, it was lighter, and the mines liked it more. So, of course, what we didn't sit still. We, we started innovating and, and creating some more products of our own. But this, to me, just perfectly illustrates how the patent system, by removing the easy option for this competitor to copy our product, which they tried initially, it actually forced them to be more innovative by coming up with something better and different. And of course, that diversity of innovation is better for society and better for everyone. For interest, Norsenet then moved into other areas as well. They created these mine safety nets, which you suspend on the, the ceiling. Mining, they call them the hanging wall. Why, why they call it a wall, I'm not sure, but it's the roof. And they suspend these uh, these nets, which then can catch minor rockfalls and also save people and, and equipment from, from harm. And their most recent product, which they developed in 2012, is also building off their netting technology. They created a theft prevention net, which you can suspend on the inside of these curtain-sided transport trucks. A big problem in this particular industry is that um, theft occurs from these trucks. Uh, someone will, you know, when the truck is parked at the depot at night or even while it's driving up a hill very slowly, they'll come along and they'll slash a, um, with a knife, they'll, they'll slash through the curtain and they will throw out a few boxes of sugar or whatever happens to be in the truck. And, and that creates a huge problem because the entire truck has to be then, stock tech has to be done, insurance claims, you can, you can imagine. So the solution here is they've, they've taken an ordinary net and they've actually threaded a wire core, a, 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 a tightly coiled uh, wire core inside the nylon rope, which makes it almost impossible to cut through with a knife or most other cutting implements. And so this will then protect the, the contents of the truck and it doesn't interfere at all with the ability of those um, sides to be rolled up and down so the forklift can access the contents. So Norsenet, I think, is a great example of a company that took their original technology, which was fishing nets, then expanded into mining and has now expanded into transport, all the while using intellectual property rights and patents in particular to protect their technologies and stay ahead of the competition as far as possible. Uh, this is a picture of their facility at, in Fredenburg. Norsenet is actually the largest private employer in Fredenburg now. Um, that's the inside of their factory there with those giant knotting machines that they use for actually tying, tying the knots in the, in the nets that they create. Now I'd like to turn, um, as promised by Letitia, to address some common misconceptions which I've heard over the years about patents, and I'm sure some of you may have encountered as well. The first, which hopefully I've already dispelled with my discussion as to why we have patents, but let's take a look a little bit as to whether or not patents stifle innovation. The second is there's no point in having a patent if you can't spend millions on enforcing it. If you're not a large company like Norsenet, what's the point of, of having a patent if, if you're not going to be able to defend it? The third is that you can't get patents for anything to do with software. That's something I encounter quite often. And then the last misconception, which I'll talk about a little bit, is that you can easily get around a patent 
by just making a few small tweaks. So, you know, what's the point of having a patent if it's so easy to get around? So let's take a look at the first one, patents stifle innovation. And this one particularly came up, I saw quite often uh, when, when we had all of those high profile lawsuits being filed between the various smartphone manufacturers. And people are saying, oh, everybody's just wasting money on patents. Surely that's making the phones more expensive for consumers. Let's take a look about a bit about the history of what they call the patent wars. Now, in the 1850s, there was what's regarded as one of the first true patent wars. It was uh, some of the key players involved there were Hauer, who was the original inventor of the um, sewing machine, and then companies that sprung up around that with various improvements and patents of their own and singer which still exists today was the was one of the big players there and what we really saw is we saw with the sudden adoption of this new technology and the sudden improvement of this new technology lots and lots of patents being generated and lots and lots of patent disputes lawsuits people filing uh, suing each other lots and lots of money being spent on attorneys and it would seem like a giant waste of course what happened in the end was that the companies resolved their differences there was actually a uh, amalgamation of a number of these patents into what we call a patent pool where a number of owners of patents will get together and say okay we need all of these patents to be able to create the products so let's agree to license each other and and you know create our, our various products um, and I think you'll agree with me that there hasn't been all that much innovation in the last couple of years in the sewing machine space. It certainly was in the 1850s. So there's a very high correlation between patent wars, or, uh, lots of litigation around patents, and the level of innovation happening at a particular time. Another example of a, of a patent war was in the 1960s, the so-called nappy patent wars. And here we had Procter & Gamble on the one side. Procter & Gamble was the original owner of the disposable nappy technology. That box shown on the left there was the very first disposable nappy available to the public. I doubt it was here in South Africa, probably in, in uh, America. And um, very quickly followed by Kimberly Clark, who created Huggies. And today those two are still the biggest players in the market. But they were suing each other left, right, and center. There was a huge amount of litigation between them in the 1960s. Even here in South Africa, we had a very big case in the, I believe this was a bit later, in about the 1980s, between Procter and Gamble and Kimberly Clark. On it was really just about the elastically extensible um, portion of the of the nappies, which gave the baby greater comfort and kept the uh, contents, shall we say of the nappy is more secure. Um, so this was another example of a lot of innovation happening and a lot of patent uh, patents being filed, but certainly patents didn't hold back the innovation in disposable nappies in the 1960s. And then most recently, as I alluded to at the beginning, the so-called smartphone patent wars, which we saw beginning in the in the 2000s with the two big players there being Apple with their iPhone and Samsung who very quickly after the iPhone came along with their uh, Galaxy and other other handset devices and this graph just shows a very complex web of who was suing who and who was licensing who at a particular point during this patent war and there were lots and lots of disputes uh, I think it's probably reaching uh reaching the point now where where there's not as much uh happening on the on the mobile smart wars front we've probably we've seen the shake up and the companies of course some of these don't really exist anymore shown in this graph research in motion on the on the left there was the one which owned the original blackberry it was where they rebranded as blackberry they are gone htc i think is gone inventec several of the others are are no longer what you often find with these patent wars, it's a bit like, you know, when the elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. Um, the uh, many companies are jostling for position in a particularly lucrative market while all this innovation is going on. And patents are really key for them to be
be able to claim as their own certain advances. Um, but it's almost never just a single patent that is determinative. It's often the companies and the, the entities that have the, the, the best technology overall that, work, that end up winning and, and that have protected their technology most effectively. The second misconception I'd like to chat about a little bit, and, and I'll give two examples here too, is I've often heard this, and particularly from small companies and individuals who've said there's really no point in having patents if you're not in a position to spend millions on litigation. So here let's talk about Snappy and let's talk about Namuno Loops. While we're on the topic of nappies, uh, even after the advent of the disposable nappy in 1986, uh, when you weren't using disposable nappies or didn't have them, you had to find a way to hold the ends of the cloth nappy together. And the technology available before 1986 was this, the safety pin. Uh, my father assures me that his fingers were bloodied and bruised all throughout my childhood and my brother's childhood from uh, constantly pricking himself in the thumb with a safety pin. Of course, my mom has a, a slightly different version of, of that story. But be that as it may, I think we can acknowledge that safety pins were not the best way of holding the ends of a cloth nappy together. So this was the snappy solution. It is a elastically extensible uh, uh, T-shaped um, device, which you can uh, which has hooks on the underneath, small little hooks on the underneath of those ends and these pull tabs and you really just hook those hooks into the fabric and it keeps it nice and securely together under, under tension. The Snappy was invented by Henny Fisser. Henny Fisser is today retired. He actually lives in Bosplasi, just, uh, just part of Onris, I guess. Perhaps we should get him to join U3A in future, but Henny Fisser, as far as I know, is still in Bosplasi. And my, uh, uh, well, Mike von Seidel, who's now retired, um, my partner, Mike von Seidel, Henny actually came to him in 1986 with this idea and said, um, you know, Mike, I've got this. And, and the original prototype was literally some elastic bands with pieces of, uh, with pieces of, of hook on the end. And he developed this product and this is the patent claim which Mike von Seidel drafted in 1986 for the Snappy. And let's have a look at this claim. A diaper fastener comprising a substantially planar base member, at least a part of which is elastically extensible, and three spaced hook or tooth formations associated with the base member, with said elastically extensible part interposed between at least two of such formations, such hook or tooth formations being operable to engage the fabric of a diaper in relevant zones thereof, with the elastically extensible part extended and operative to maintain the hook or tooth formations in engagement with the diaper fabric to hold the diaper in its functional position. Now this is actually a really good patent claim and the reason for it is, it, it may sound quite narrow, but it's actually extremely broad. If you look at it, it requires a planar base member, so that means this thing is generally flat. It requires the three spaced hook or tooth formations associated with a base member, but it doesn't specify the particular shape that this snappy needs to have. It doesn't, for example, say a T-shaped, or it doesn't say even three elastically extensible arms radiating from a central portion or something like that. And the reason that's important is because what we try and do as patent attorneys is protect not just the specific embodiment that the client has created, but to really try and think more broadly and laterally and protect future possible design arounds. So have a look at these other three drawings next to the original snappy drawing. If Mike had drafted a claim that required the snappy to have three arms radiating, radiating from a central portion, then that triangular shaped uh, design, a potential design around, would not, have, uh, would not have infringed the patent. If he then said, okay, I can think about that alternative, and then just said, well, there have to be three elastically extensible arms, 
then the one on the far right, which is just a piece of rubber in the shape of a triangle, would not have infringed the patent. Or even just one which was a ring with, with three hooks on, on, on the different zones. So as the patent claim is drafted here, all of those alternatives, none of which are actual products out there, but um, if you know, all of those fall within the scope of that patent claim. So you can see here as well that it's actually a very broad concept that's being protected. It's really just saying you have three hooks, hook formation spaced apart, and you have some way of urging them towards, you, towards each other so as to keep the ends of the diaper in engagement. Um, so the protection afforded by a patent can actually be very broad indeed. So what happened to Henny Fisser? Well, between 1986 and 1994, he borrowed money from friends and family and he ran the business on the side. In 1991, he started exporting. By 1992, he was selling about 5,000 a month. And only in 1994, a full eight years after he started the business, did he go full time into it. And by mid 2006, over 50 million of these had been sold, all of which were manufactured here in South Africa. Henny has subsequently retired from Snappy, <clears throat> but they continue today, still based in Pretoria, and still manufacturing Snappies and selling them all over the world. Of course, the original 1986 patent has now expired. It would have expired in uh, 2006, but they have several subsequent patents which have been filed. I haven't got a slide for that, but I, uh, off the top of my head, they relate to various ways in which to prevent those hooks from falling off the ends. The, the way that the end tabs are gripped is actually one of them now that has a, a little shield that you can fold around the hooks when you're not using them so you don't prick yourself accidentally. So um, of course, now that original snappy patent is in the public domain, anyone in the world is free to manufacture that without restriction and has been since 2006. But the newest version of snappy is still on patent and still protected. The next fun example I'm going to give is a more recent one of a client of mine that created a product called Nemuno Loops, the toy block tape. This was a product created at the beginning of 2017. The idea is to have a flexible sticky bat toy block base, which you can then stick on various surfaces, you can cut into shape, and you could do all kinds of creative things with Lego, like building upside down, or up the side of walls, or across surfaces like handlebars of bicycles, or onto the back of a dinosaur, uh, that you can't do with Lego currently. The creators of this product are three inventors here in Cape Town, a small company called Chrome Cherry Design Studio, and the inventors are Neen, Yaku, and Max. And what they did was they, they decided that they would crowdfund this particular invention. Now, crowdfunding is uh, something that the, has been around for a few years now. And what you do is you go to a website like Indiegogo or Kickstarter. There are a couple of them here in South Africa. We have one called Thunder Fund. And you effectively create a prototype of a product and you create a promotional video and you offer to pre-sell a product which hasn't yet been created in, in a commercial form to uh, anyone who wants to buy it. And in turn, the buyers have the satisfaction of knowing that they are bringing a new product into being that wouldn't otherwise have, have been funded. And they're there thereby, uh, and they're of course getting the very first shipments of that new product. Um, so you're not, you're not selling shares in a business. You're really just pre-selling a product you haven't created yet. Isn't that an amazing business model? But um, that's one of the things the internet enables. So they launched their Indiegogo campaign for Namuno Loops in March of 2017. Campaign only runs for three weeks. So you've only got three weeks to gather uh, as many what they call backers as possible. And they set the goal of raising eight thousand dollars. They said if they could raise eight thousand dollars, that would that would be enough for them to uh, ship the products to everyone who pre-ordered them. Well, it took off completely virally, and within a few weeks, they had 
a million, $1.65 million in funds raised, 20,000% more than their $8,000 target. And they had raised the money from 44,000 backers all over the world. So this is, this is what can happen. Of course, this isn't the typical experience, um, but the, uh, you know, this is what can happen with, with um, crowdfunding. Unfortunately, uh, this was some of the uh, free press that we had at the time. I say we, because it's my client, but at Chrome Cherry had um, described as Nemuno Loops, also known as Lego Tape, might be 2017 best invention. This genius Lego Tape is every building block lover's dream. This genius tape makes any friend surface Lego friendly. The world needs Lego Tape more than we realized. And Anine, the inventor who also showed the product at the Toy Fair in New York in 2017, was invited by Time Magazine to their headquarters in New York. In New York. And they, I think, were on page three of Time Magazine. All of this without spending a single cent on, on advertising or promotion, just through the amazing success of their crowdfunding campaign. But unfortunately, within two weeks of launching, we also had this. Have a look there. Meet Lego tape. Instantly transforms any surface into a base for Lego blocks. Notice the dinosaur, which was also imaged, uh, pirated from the, uh, the product, which uh, the Namuno Loops product. We also had this sticky bricky, the original toy block tape. Really? No, you weren't the original. Namuno Loops was the original. We also had this build bonanza, the amazing building block tape. Again, the dinosaur, they kept copying our dinosaur. Um, and this flexi blocks. Lego block tape, they will love you for it, delivering fast worldwide, and literally dozens of others like them. So with the initial success of the Indiegogo campaign, we also had this enormous problem with what we would call infringement or copying happening right away. Fortunately, however, we had a patent application which was filed before the date of launching the campaign, we had also filed registered design applications to protect the visual appearance of the product, trademark applications for Namuno Loops, and we were able to get copyright in some countries registered as well. Um, this is my colleague, uh, my partner, Christine, who's on the trademark side, so she helped with some of the trademark enforcement. And because we had these registered IP rights, we were able to secure a worldwide license with a company called Zuru, which is one of the fastest growing and largest toy manufacturers and toy marketers in the world. And that was launched under their brand called Maker in 2017. And they have been selling this product worldwide now for the past three years. I unfortunately can't disclose the uh, details of that uh, particular license deal, um, but uh, it didn't require my client to um, of course, that Zuru took on the, the risk and took on the market, and and our, my client effectively became the licensor and the collector of royalties on this product. Um, so I think you can see that both in the case of uh, Snappy, the creation of Henny Fisser, and in the case of Nemuno Loops, the product started out with, uh, or the inventors had very limited budgets, but they did take the time to protect the intellectual property, and that enabled them to secure those rights and to achieve commercial success. You may be wondering to yourself, what on earth can you patent with a flexible block or flexible toy block base? Well, here's claim one of our, of our patent. The toy building block base comprising a flexible elongate body strip, having a first major surface along the length of the strip that includes either an array of projections extending from the first major surface or an array of recesses set into the first major surface. We actually had a version of the, of the tape, which was what we call the receiver tape, which was the opposite to those studs, which, which you could put the studs of a Lego block into. The projections or recesses, recesses forming a mating arrangement for a cooperant toy building blocks. The body strip having an opposite second major surface 
that is either flat or has at least one shallow flat bottomed longitudinal recess, in either case with the longitudinal adhesive layer by which the body strip can be attached to a support surface, wherein the body strip includes no more than four projections or recesses across its width. We had a, a two stud and a four stud version of the product and has a length of at least 200 millimeters, the entire body strip being made from a homogeneous flexible material. And there's the patent drawings that you can also see with the adhesive backing um, at the back. This was actually a version, an improvement of the product, which had these cutting guidelines that you can see there, numeral 36, which help you cut the strip into a, you know, accurately if you're cutting it lengthwise or, or crosswise. The next uh, myth I'd like to look at is this common belief that nothing to do with software can be patented. And it's not entirely unfounded because we do in South Africa and most countries in the world have a restriction against the kinds of things you're allowed to patent. So in South Africa, section 25 of the Patents Act says that you cannot patent discoveries, scientific theories, mathematical methods, aesthetic creations, a method for performing a mental act, playing a game or doing business, a program for a computer, the presentation of information, animal or plant varieties or essentially biological processes other than microbiological processes, and then methods of treating humans or animals through surgery, therapy, or diagnosis. Now, um, the important thing here is that those restrictions only apply to the extent to which the patent relates to that thing as such. And I've highlighted the relevant parts here, a method for doing business, you can't patent. We, we sometimes have clients who come along with ideas that really are just methods of doing business. Let me give you one example. Uh, the first person who actually thought of the idea of having every price in their shop end in 99 cents, it was a really good idea, not just because you think that things are cheaper if it's 2.99 as opposed to three rand, but also because it provides you with a very handy way of doing stock take. Because if you're using a manual cash register and you're giving the right change to every person and giving everyone who comes into your store one cent in change, you have to look at the, um, the number of cents you have left in your cash register. And if you've sold 20 products, you will have 79 cents of change in your cash register. So it's actually a, a, a quick way of, of making sure you're not losing stock too quickly. That would be an example of a method of doing business as such, you wouldn't be able to get a patent for that. Um, but with software or a program for a computer, it's only if you really try to protect that program itself that it's a problem. Here's an example of a patent I drafted for a client of mine called Carney Smartworks. And what they've discovered, what they know, uh, the patent addresses is a problem that's inherent in electricity meters in South Africa. We can, and these prepaid meters were actually developed here in South Africa. The meters have something called a token identifier, which represents the number of minutes that have elapsed since the 1st of January, 1993. And on the 24th of November, 2024, that token ID will roll over to zero. And every new token that you try and input after that date will be rejected by your meter as an old token, unless you receive a meter update key. And this is actually a huge problem because there's a deadline of the 24th of November, 2024 to update meters. And many of the utility or many of the municipalities and ESCOM itself don't know where these meters are. And so it's unlikely they'll be able to get around to all the meters to do the token, re, uh, new tokens by 24, 24. So the solution is really to change the resolution of this algorithm that generates the token identifier. If you look at that, uh, original orange line going up from the 1st of January, 1993. That's the current rate at which the token identifiers are being used and it's going to hit 100% capacity in 2024. But if on a particular date, and this example here was in 2017, you change the resolution of the algorithm so it generates, say, a new TID every 10 minutes, you can conserve them and you can postpone that rollover date until much later, say, 2095 giving you another 80 years or so, which is probably what ESCOM would need to do those meter rekeys. Could something like that possibly be patentable? Well, here's claim one, 
of the patent we drafted for this. A method of obtaining a token identifier for use in generating a token for a prepayment meter. The method comprising obtaining a transition TID value associated with a selected transition date. This is the date on which you decide we're switching over. The transition TID value being greater than any TID values generated prior to the transition date. The ones generated prior to the transition date having been obtained by counting a number of original time intervals that elapsed from a specified TID base date and then determining a new TID by counting the number of new time intervals that have elapsed since the transition date and adding the transition TID value, wherein the new time interval is longer than the original time interval. So although this is implemented in software, we're not really claiming the computer program as such. We're claiming the method for generating these tokens. And uh, that would be a good example of a software-related patent, which I submit is not a pure software patent. Another example here is a Stellenbosch spin-out company called Kustos. They've developed a way of using the blockchain, which I'm sure you've heard about, but it's really a distributed ledger system that they can embed uh, media into media files. They can embed small amounts of cryptocurrency effectively so that you can track the distribution of that media item, for example, to for pre-launches of films and this kind of thing. I'm not going to read the whole claim one, but there it is. Uh, that's the granted United States patent for the Kustos blockchain media rights management technology. Also very much software related, but the patent itself is not a computer program as such. Now I'm going to turn to one of the other misconceptions, which is can a competitor just get around a patent by making a couple of tweaks? And the answer, is it's all about the claims. Now we've looked at several claims already. This is a spin-out company also from Stellenbosch University called SharkSafe. What they've done is they've created an artificial kelp barrier, which is effective at keeping out sharks from uh, areas where humans swim. And it is it uses the principle of biomimicry. They, they have these uh, tubes effectively that they anchor to the bottom and which, which float and uh, they don't harm any marine life and sharks apparently don't like kelp they also have magnets in them too which i believe has a repellent effect to the sharks so now have a look at this claim one over here now, claim one says oops sorry a shark barrier comprising a plurality of resiliently flexible elongate members extending in a generally upright condition between a sea floor and a sea surface the elongate members arranged so as to have the appearance of a thicket when viewed from within the water. That claim one is incredibly wide, doesn't specify what it's made of, exactly how it's constructed, but really just the principle, which is create something that has the appearance of a thicket and erect it on a seabed. So I think you can see that to get around that claim or design around that claim would be very hard indeed. Just for interest, what we do with patents is we, do, we not only have a single claim, we actually have a series of claims which each add additional features to the broadest claim and which give you fallback positions in case your broadest claim is held to be too broad. So, for example, here claim two, it says, wherein the elongate members are arranged so as to resemble a kelp forest. Claim three, wherein magnets are arranged on the barrier with each of the elongate members of the barrier, including at least one magnet. Claim four, we're in the magnets of barium ferrite magnets. Claim five, we're in the barrier is movably secured to the sea floor by at least one anchoring base. Those are all the nested narrow features that you can rely upon if your patent ends up being too broad. And here's another example of a wonderful South African product, also a client of our firm called Red Espresso. They were the world's first creator of a espresso type Bush tea product, Roibos product, and they were successful. We were successful in obtaining a European patent for this invention. And here's an example of a claim that's perhaps somewhat narrower. A bush tea product being a bush tea that's in the form in which it's ready for the consumer market for the purpose of the preparation of beverages by a customer by an extraction process in which the tea is contacted with hot water. The bush tea product being characterized in that at least 10% by weight of the bush tea present is pulverized bush tea, in which at least 50% by weight of the pulverized tea has a particle size selected to pass a 0.5 millimeter mesh screen 
and at least 10% by weight is in powder form that passes a 0.15 millimeter mesh screen. So here to get around the prior art, I mean, we couldn't just say powdered bush tea because that actually existed on the, on, in the dust on the floor of the, the tea threshing uh, uh, factories. We had to limit it to the particular composition or the particular range of values that actually works in practice. So it, it, the claim is narrower, but again, it's still effective to protect them because a competitor wanting to put a rooibos product into a espresso type uh, uh, coffee maker effectively would need to have that range of particle sizes. So that is how we protected their product um, in this case in the European patent. And of course we have South African patents and patents in other countries as well. Here are four examples of well-known South African inventions, which have been around for many decades. You all know about Dolosa, those interlocking uh, breakwater uh, boulders that you see next to the New Harbour and Hermanus and other places. The great South African inventions, Prati Pati and the Sheftington's bogey. And I'd like to conclude by saying that what patents really do is to help transform these technologies of yesterday into the technologies and the creations that we have today. Um, for interest, this top left drawing over here is the one I haven't spoken about um, through the course of the presentation, but that is the wave energy converter that is being built at uh, Abagol in Hermanus. It's also protected by South African patents um, for the particular solutions they've come up with to create this wave energy converter and, and make it work in practice. So that concludes my, my talk. Thank you very much. I, I see we have just a few minutes left, but uh, I'm in no hurry. So please fire away with any questions you may have, and I would be happy to, to answer or just have a general discussion. Thank you, Rolf. Right, we open for questions. Any questions? May I, Tisha Gert speaking? Yes, morning, Gert. Ralph, in my limited experience with patents, there are three issues, two of which you've addressed, namely the fact that you have to describe the product in detail once the patent is filed, so it's then theoretically available to anybody to see. Secondly, you have to be able to defend it. But thirdly, it doesn't help to just register it in South Africa. You have to register it in every country in the world where you want it to be protected. How do you go about that without incurring a huge amount of expense? That's a very good point, um, Gert. So South Africa belongs to two very important international conventions. The first of which is called the Paris Convention. And what the Paris Convention says is if you file a patent application in any one of our member countries, within 12 months, you can file in any other member country and we will give you the benefit of the original filing date. So that means you don't have to file immediately in all the countries of interest. You have the 12 months afforded by the Paris Convention in which to extend your rights internationally. South Africa also belongs to something called the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which both of those, the Paris Convention and the Patent Cooperation Treaty cover, I think the Patent Cooperation Treaty covers 106, 56 member countries and the Paris Convention 165. So it's pretty much the entire world. So what you do is you file first in South Africa and then within 12 months, you file this thing called a PCT application and that gives you another 18 months before you eventually do have to file in the various countries of interest. So the answer to your question is ultimately yes. If you want to have the right to exclude in Turkey or in Afghanistan, you will need to file a local patent application there. But you don't have to do so immediately. There are, there's, a, there's a way to delay those costs up to two and a half years from your first patent filing date, 13 months, 12 plus the 18. And that will give you hopefully enough time to discover whether the invention is worth extending internationally or not, to raise the funds if it's something that you are uh, creating from scratch. And, um, and also I would add very few companies or individuals will file in more than a handful of overseas countries. You'll typically look at your major markets and say, well, I'll protect this in the, in the United States. Europe gives you single application which you can cover the whole of the European Union and actually 
It also includes the UK, even post-Brexit, because it's not a European instrument. It's confusing, but it covers the UK as well. And so you'll file in Europe, uh, the US, and perhaps China, and, and stop there. Um, but that decision you can postpone by up to two and a half years by filing these other applications along the way. Thank you. Yeah, Ralph, if I can ask, can I ask a question? How do you how do you police patents and you know copyright in countries like China and India? Well, uh, no, the, the patent offices don't do it for you. It's still mm -hmm. it's still your responsibility. Um, you these days with with online products, it's actually quite easy to discover infringement. I've got a client actually with this. Um, this product, Namuno Loops, we are uh, we we searched for infringement on platforms like Alibaba and uh, online marketplaces in China, and we actually used that to to find uh, find infringement. But um, what you can also do, of course, if you can partner with a larger company by licensing your rights, then they will typically take on the, the obligation of of enforcing the IP rights. But it is something which is the responsibility of the patentee. And sometimes if it's a patent for purely internal process, it may not be worth filing it for that reason that, you know, it would be very hard to discover infringement. You wouldn't know if your competitor were doing it or not. So, so it also depends on what the patent relates to. Some patents are, you know, easy to find infringement others much, much harder. And that's a very relevant consideration when you, when you decide whether or not to, to file a patent application. Thank you. Um, Ralph, I've got a question. You, um, at the start of your talk, you were mentioning amongst other things, how uh, at a university, they, uh, a lecturer can develop some application that can then be patented. What I would like to know in that case, does the intellectual property belong to that lecturer or to the university? It belongs to the university, but the universities have a IP policy, um, in fact, all of them do, that gives the researcher the right to share in the benefit of that invention. Okay. So in the case of Stellenbosch University, I believe they will, if they get, if they get licensed revenue from the from the invention, if they're able to say license um, something in the department of, you know, wine, Wingert and Weinbow, if they can license that out and, and collect royalties from industry, you as the researcher are, I think, entitled to 10% and your department to 20%. So, you know, you, you not only you could, could you benefit personally from it, but you could also benefit your, uh, your research funds within the university. And then what we often see and what what we've seen with uh, the two examples I mentioned, Kustos and Sharksafe, is the university will spin out the company. They will then they, they will then do a deal where the university will transfer the intellectual property to the spin out company in exchange for shares in that spin out company. So the university will end up owning, say, 20 or 30 percent of the spin out company. But the intellectual property that the university owns will then be transferred to that company and it will be run as a commercial enterprise. And that is actually the model that has been very successfully used in the United States too. I mean, if you just take the example of Google, the original Google patent for what's called the PageRank algorithm is owned, uh, or I believe it's still owned by Stanford University, but licensed exclusively to Google to use for um, you know, running their business. So, so the what I always explain to researchers is, yes, the university does own the intellectual property that you create while you're an academic or even a student at the university, yet the IP policy is going to give you certain protections, plus the university is going to foot the bill of doing all of that uh, protection of the intellectual property and also um, finding those commercial links um, to hopefully create something out of it. Thank you. Ralph, if I walk through your door with a patent now, what's it typically going to cost me until from the day that we sit down and until it's now registered? Or am I asking how long a piece of string is? No, it's a reasonable question, Henny. I mean, 
I would say, so you have two options initially. You could either file a provisional patent application or a complete patent application. A provisional is a bit less expensive, probably in the order of about 25,000 Rand and a complete patent application in the order of about 35,000 Rand. And the complete patent application will mature into a granted South African patent. So that, that basically gets you a patent. The provisional, you'll still have to then follow up with a complete patent application. The reason some clients file the provisional first is because their invention is not yet in a, in a final form or it's not yet in a, um, uh, you know, it's, they're going to be making changes and improvements that they want to incorporate into that complete patent application. And then the PCT application I mentioned, there's actually, if you're a South African resident and citizen, there's a, a very big dis discount in the official fees, a 75% discount in the costs that we have to pay in Swiss francs to the, in, in the World Intellectual Property in Geneva that reduces the costs for for a company, a PCT application ballpark would be about 100,000 Rand. For an individual, it's probably about 45,000 Rand or so. Um, so, you know, it's not nothing, um, certainly not. Uh, but if it's something valuable and if there's large commercial opportunity, then um, it's, it's not the millions that people think uh, it might be, at least not until you, you know, get to that two and a half year mark and decide on filing in many, many countries. Um, so, so yeah, that, I mean, Henny, for example, when he filed, I should probably find out from Mike what, what a patent cost in 1986, but, um, it, the system is frequently used by individuals by, you know, we see patents for, um, obviously something simple, like a mechanical device will be, will be less expensive than something, you know, that's based on a whole thesis of, and, and perhaps is chemistry or biotechnology and, and requires a lot of research on our part. So, but that, that gives you a rough idea of, of, of the costs here in South Africa. Okay, and then patent search, uh, you know, do you, is that, does that take quite a while or is it, you know, of course, I, when I lodged my patent in the 80s as well, it took an enormous long time for them to do the patent search and quite a bit of a cost was involved. Is it still the same now? Or is it much cheaper to do that with the technology that we have? It is much cheaper. And, and, you know, I always encourage the inventor, him or herself, to do their own patent searching because particularly on the Google Advanced Patent Platform, which is already plugged into the European Patent Office, the US Patent Office, the Chinese Patent Office, and does translations and keyword stemmings for you you know, you do it like a Google search, really. So that's become much easier to, to do your own um, patent, what we call prior art searching or patentability investigations. Um, the patent office themselves will do an assessment of the patent, not the South African patent office, but if you file anywhere overseas. We still here in South Africa have what's called a patent registration system. So they don't substantively examine the patent until there's a dispute then the court will be looking at it closely. But before then, it just gets registered. But if you file, for example, in the UK or Europe or the US or anywhere else, the patent office there will do their own search and examination. Um, so it's much better to know yourself what the nearest prior art is before filing than to only discover that what you thought was a new, new idea actually isn't. But to answer your question, it's much easier these days because everything pretty much is available online. A follow-up to my previous question. What stops a company from manufacturing something they saw, like the sticky bricks, in another jurisdiction, a small island somewhere, and getting around the patent problem then? Well, remember that a patent protects you not only from the manufacturing, but also from the sale. So in the case of our sticky bricks, we had well, our Lego tape, we had it patents in all the major jurisdictions, China, the US, Europe, South Africa, Australia, I think, and a few others. But if someone were to manufacture it in Indonesia and sell it in, you know, uh, some other small country, that wouldn't be a problem. But they couldn't manufacture it in Indonesia and sell it in China because we had a patent in China or sell it in the US because we had a patent in the US. So as long as you cover your major manufacturing markets and your major consumption markets, then you know, you've covered maybe 80% of the market for that product globally, and you don't have to worry about 
uh, the smaller markets. There'll, there'll be a little bit of leakage, but you know that's that, that you always have. Oh, that's very interesting. I wasn't aware of that distinction. That's very, that uh, really relieves that problem. Thank you. Yeah, it does. And in fact, the U.S. in particular, you can't even you can't even export the information from the U.S. to manufacture a patented in article abroad. That that infringes a U.S. patent. So, really, doing anything in a country with a patent that involves that invention will will infringe the patent, um, whether it's manufacturing, using, importing, uh, etc. Unless there are any more urgent questions, I think we should bring this to a conclusion now. Well, Rolf, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Thank you to all of you for joining in. And Henny, thank you for hosting this absolutely splendid presentation.